So welcome back everybody. I am here with MEP Charlie Weimers of the Sweden Democrats Party and it's very good to speak to you today, Charlie. Great to be with you. So you made headlines recently for your criticism of the Irish Taoiseach, obviously Michal Martin and uh, Ireland's approach to migration and I wanted to speak a little bit about that with you but before we get into that issue, if you could introduce uh, us to Sweden's experience of the migration issue? Because I think over here in Ireland, we know that Sweden tends to be a very liberal country in a lot of ways, and Scandinavia in general, it's sort of held up as this idealistic utopia that we should all be aspiring to, sort of the European ideal. But then when you speak to some Swedish people on the ground, the reality of some of these policies is very different. So I'm wondering if you would want to speak a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, Sweden has had one of the most liberal migration uh, policies of Europe uh, for the last um, 20, 30 years. It goes back all the way to the 70s, actually, when the government introduced uh, multiculturalism, uh, ended labor migration and replaced it with asylum migration. Um, and um, that has led to a situation today where we have uh, approximately 20% of our population being born outside the country, 25% of the first time voters in the uh, natural elections this fall are foreign born up from 12% 20 years ago. So it has been a really rapid development and a change of our social fabric that we are still, you know, trying to keep up with uh, um, as, as uh, citizens, inhabitants of Sweden. Uh, and uh, you have seen a lot, of, um, a lot of problems in the wake of this mass migration to Sweden. Um, No-go zones uh, are a reality, and that uh, we saw during the Easter where um, the police was uh, brutally attacked by mobs uh, throughout the country, um, up to 200 police officers injured. Uh, we have uh, Arabic replacing Finnish as the second language in Sweden. Um, and uh, the most uh, common language to study on uh, Duolingo in Sweden is Swedish. So um, you have a lot of concrete effects. Uh, I can just uh, mention the fact that uh, dominance violence has become a term um, in Sweden after Swedes have been harassed and, and, and uh, uh, attacked uh, by Swedish kids, young Swedish kids attacked by, by uh, gangs um, originally from the Middle East and Africa. Uh, and um, in the wake of that, the term generation prey has been um, coined to describe these young uh, children and adolescents being targeted. Uh, and by the uh, gangs themselves, they are being called orphans because they have no clan or family that can back them up, unlike these gangs. Now, obviously, when some people hear about this, their first instinct is going to be, well, this is just uh, z xenophobia, this is, you know, just being intolerant of other people's views. And I mean, you mentioned the incidents at Easter and uh, those, I believe, were Quran riots. An individual had burned a copy of the, the Quran and Muslims were understandably angry. I mean, anybody would be annoyed if you burned their holy text and it resulted in these nationwide riots where, as you say, hundreds of police officers were injured. What would you say to someone who said this is just all uh, scaremongering and bigotry and so on, as, as the media likes to claim? Well, as a Christian, I would be uh, antagonized if someone burns the Bible, but I wouldn't attack uh, the police uh, to, to prove my point. I would uh, make the case uh, for not burning the Bible uh, in a democratic fashion. But according to, according to these people who attacked the police, the police was actually violating them by protecting, upholding freedom of speech. So there is, uh, this migration has caused less support for our constitutional rights, uh, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of speech, and so on, among a bigger and bigger part of the population. And we're not talking uh, small numbers here. I mean, um, since, since the year 2000, uh, almost 800,000 people applied for asylum in Sweden. And adding to that, you, uh, Sweden granted uh, 
the last um, 12 years, almost 500,000 resident permits on the basis of family reunification. So we're talking really big numbers. And um, that is not xenophobia to point out. It's not racist to point out the fact that Europe is a magnet for economic migration. Being rich, being a prosperous, high quality of life, of course, a lot of people would want to move here and we need to face up to that reality before reality uh, catches up with us. And the Irish tea shock is very clearly not doing that by uh, offering this amnesty. Um, 17,000 people was the figure I heard and no one really seems to know, but um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the amnesty in Sweden in 2005 was for 16,000 people. And um, even though uh, you had some external factors, the Iraq war, later the war in Syria that contributed to um, you know, high migration to Europe, Sweden signaled uh, to uh, the rest of the world that we want as many as possible. And we can we can offer you uh, gold over here. Uh, Sweden even produced a leaflet in Arabic on how to apply for welfare benefits that was um, handed out in the Middle East. So I mean that it's pretty much the the same kind of thinking that the Irish government is is uh, is you know pursuing right now. So it's it's just the reality. So coming then to your comments to the Taoiseach, uh, in, in the European Parliament you said that this year one shooting a day, one bombing a week and areas ruled by criminal gangs to name my country, meaning Sweden, the most dangerous country in Europe. And I think for a lot of people that's hard to wrap their heads around, especially in Ireland or in Western Europe, you know, you think Sweden, the beautiful Sweden, that's the most dangerous country in Europe. Is that true? Are those stories exaggerated that we hear? Or, or you know, what, why do you think these stories don't reach some parts of Western Europe where people aren't aware of the situation? Well, it breaks my heart that it had has come to this, uh, that my, my beautiful country where I could uh, move freely and go to festivals and maybe maybe have a few beers too much, uh, but, but uh, having then someone taking care of me instead of urinating on me. I mean, you have that kind of violence in Sweden today. You have, um, you even have um, in Gothenburg clans dominating the suburbs of Gothenburg, establishing checkpoints for anyone that Pa passes through, uh, thus effectively removing the monopoly of violence from uh, the, the, the police. Um, and um, you have these kind of um, tendencies trickling down now from the big cities throughout Sweden in medium-sized cities. This is, this is now the reality for all those people who cannot buy themselves out of this by moving to areas where a few uh, Middle East African immigrants live. Um, and and um, I'm, 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 I mean, the Buller Bee uh, that we used to know has become Baltimore or Baghdad. It's just the way it is. I'm after hearing a story that obviously the war in Ukraine is still taking place and, and uh, that country is going through a lot of turmoil right now. But I heard reported in the Swedish media that there was a series of buses that were attempting to evacuate refugees from Ukraine and that there were many people who were reportedly reluctant to get on the bus to Sweden, certain parts of Sweden, because they said, oh, no, that's too dangerous. And you think <laughs> you're in an active war zone and there's parts of this peaceful country where you would be afraid to go, which uh, is an astonishing situation and one that I could see happening in, in lots of uh, countries in Western Europe now. I would call that uh, due diligence uh, by the Ukrainians. I mean, um, you had a situation as, at a refugee center where Ukrainian women were encouraged to um, wear modest clothing in order to uh, not provoke um, immigrants from other parts of the world um, and uh, so they basically were encouraged not to wear too short shorts and, and, and so on and so forth and this is the Swedish way of dealing with this it's not uh, the um, 
people from Islamic countries that should adapt to 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 our way of life. Uh, it's us adapting slowly but surely. Another instance was when uh, uh, um, Swedish language courses for refugees established a a wall, paper wall between men and women uh, by demand of uh, Muslim males that refused to have classes together with women or establishing separate uh, times at public baths uh, for women and, and men in order not to, to, to step on any uh, Muslim toes. This is for Swedish authorities handing out leaflets once again for you who are married uh, with uh, underage women, a guide for you who are married with underage women or girls, as I would prefer to call them. Uh, this, is, this is the way they are. And then the Ukrainians may have read a little bit of this. Um, of course, Ukrainians prefer to, to stay in Central European countries who have had a, a stricter view on immigration than Sweden um, to, to keep themselves out of danger. Now, of course, not all, and, and I know this is almost, uh, uh, it's such an obvious point, it's almost not worth saying, but not all migrants coming to a country are going to be harmful. Some of them will be lovely people who will integrate perfectly into a society. In fact, many of them, you know, every, everybody knows this and everybody accepts this. So what would you say to somebody who said that, it's not fair to paint everyone with a broad brush that, you know, we can obviously there's going to be, you know, a few bad apples in every group, but that that doesn't invalidate the overall group being allowed to come and, you know, enjoy the, the fruits of a country. What, what would you say to that? I would say that it's uh, perfectly true that not everyone from coming from an Islamic country will, will pose a threat or be a problem for uh, mainstream society. Uh, um, there will be instances where people assimilate, become part of the majority population, come to appreciate our way of life. It, yeah, it goes without saying. But as a politician making decisions that affect millions of lives, you will have to uh, be able to make generalizations, right? And for instance, in Norway, they did a, a poll showing that uh, 41 percent of Muslims in Norway would want blasphemy to be outlawed. Okay, so 60, 59 percent said no, and that's good. But if you then look at 41 percent, how many of them would uh, would uh, use violence to uh, push for their stance? Well, it adds up to quite a few thousand individuals who, who would actually be ready to do that. And the question you must ask yourself is, would you want a bigger and bigger share of the population not, you know, loving free speech in their hearts, but actually wishing another constitution, Sharia-based constitution, to be the law of the land? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Are you ready to, to um, uh, you know, sacrifice the, the security and safety of of youngsters in your country in order to to show solidarity with other parts of the world. What is your main duty as uh, a holder of public office? Well, my main duty is towards the Swedish citizens, and I, I will not be ashamed of that. Now, coming to Ireland and your remarks regarding the Taoiseach and Ireland's immigration policy, you said something which I found very interesting, that Ireland's amnesty policy will worsen migration pressures on Europe. And, I mean, it's no secret that Ireland is very pro-EU. In fact, I would say that I think Ireland is the most pro-EU country in Europe. But... Uh, with that said, what impact do you think this mass amnesty will have on the rest of the European Union? Because we all we talk about how it's going to affect us internally, but of course, once somebody is given residency rights and citizenship, they have then the freedom to travel on to Germany or Sweden or Italy or anywhere else they want. And so there's a bigger conversation to be had there, I think, about what impact this is going to have on the bloc as a whole. What, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think that when the Irish re realize that we are heading towards a transfer union in which they will be net contributors sending money to other parts of Europe with the economies that are not being uh, especially well run, I, I think that maybe the Irish will reconsider its strong 
EU federalism. Well, but, well you know, uh, it's, it's unfortunately, we've, we've already been uh, net contributors for a good few years at this point, and uh, it, yeah, doesn't, it doesn't seem to have put a dent in the level of love for the, the European project and all of its glory. Um, people still seem to have this love affair with it. Right, but it took 25 years after the Maastricht Treaty until the British were, you know, um, actually voting against the European Union. So, so it's, um, I think it's a step-by-step -step process. Um, and I think when the Corona Fund 2.0 comes, I'm sure it will, then, then uh, the debate will be uh, refreshed. Um, I certainly hope so. It's, it's needed because uh, the, the trajectory of the European Union right now is not sound. It's, uh, it's, it's not even federalism, it's centralism. Anyway, um, I, the reason why I, I posed this question to the Taoiseach was that as long as there are um, member states, governments in Europe signaling to the rest of the world uh, where 500 million people would want to move to Europe if given the opportunity, as long as, as, as uh, member states signal that, okay, you can come here illegally, we'll give you uh, welfare benefits, we'll offer you citizenship, amnesty, uh, and so on, the migration pressure on Europe will increase. Uh, because um, even though we are, you know, we, we are now um, realizing the fact that we have had mass migration to Western Europe for quite a few decades, that pales in comparison to what we are facing now when uh, Diasporas are already established in Western Europe, thus attracting more people um, to um, come. Because you know, when your when your kin are already there, it's easier to go. In in Sweden, you don't even have to to learn Swedish to to live a whole life uh, in our country anymore. You know, because of the big diasporas, you have that. And you have demography. You have Af the African population, according to the UN. Uh, rising from 1.4 billion today to 4 billion uh, at the end of this century. It's pure mathematics that if you act as a magnet, sure, you will, you will uh, have people come. And this is uh, reckless by the Irish government. And they are not only um, making it worse for, for the Irish or already facing a high housing crisis and uh, social problems, homeless people, they are making it worse for the whole of Europe, as is my government, which I hope to replace this fall. Well, uh, you referenced illegal migrants, both in your speech and just there. And it seems like many world leaders at this point are afraid to even use that word. We have the new kind of euphemism, which is... Uh, undocumented or irregular migration and all these types of terms, which I find funny. I mean, it is a, is a drug dealer and a uh, undocumented pharmacist that it's, it's sort of a play on words where we're trying to hide the fact that if you sneak into a country against the wishes of the state or under the radar, that is a crime, you know, that's in breach of the country's laws, the host country. And so why do you think uh, leaders like Michal Martin and many other European leaders are so afraid to just call a spade a spade and, and use the correct verbiage when discussing this issue. I mean, George Orwell would be proud, wouldn't he? Um, I, I, I guess a reason why the, the why Taoiseach Martin is not addressing this in a way that, for example, even the liberal president of France is doing is because of the historical migration experience of the Irish. Economic migration is a part of Irish history. It's part of Swedish history as well. And for long, these comparisons were made in Sweden as well until it was no longer really possible to make, to make a comparison uh, between our emigration to the United States, Canada, other places, and this kind of migration because uh, actually the migration of the Irish and, and um, the Swedes to uh, the United States, even though, you know, caused some problems, um, eventually it contributed strongly to uh, that society's prosperity. Um, 
and this is not the case here. You, I mean, the average time for um, an immigrant to get a job in Sweden, that's, um, that's uh, eight years. Um, that was not the case in Illinois for Swedes or Minnesota. Um, so I guess that's one of the reasons. And it was quite striking that uh, uh, Tishok Martin uh, also talked about about multiculturalism in a positive fashion. I mean, haven't he followed the European debate the last 10, 15 years where even, you know, David Cameron, Angela Merkel, others have publicly stated that multiculturalism is dead. The idea of se establishing separate culture within one state is doomed to fail. And uh, I think uh, that the... Um, uh, the, the um, experience of Yugoslavia is, is quite instructive in that matter. Um, so basically what, what the Irish, <laughs> what, what my, recommend, my humble recommendation to all Irish uh, wanting to establish a, a, an up-to-date debate on this is to, to um, start a questioning the multiculturalism of the government because uh, it seems to be the official policy. And the, I mean, in the rest of Europe, that's just, you know, that that ship has sailed. It's, well, I it's gone. It's what they say that uh, smart people learn from their mistakes, but wise people learn from the mistakes of others. And you kind of wish we would look at the experience of places that are a bit further down this road than we are and maybe take a leaf out of their book. Um, speaking of the multiculturalism issue, I do feel personally like a lot of these problems come from European cultures in general being sort of watered down and diluted that I don't think people in Ireland and in many other parts of Europe have a strong sense of what it even means to be Irish anymore as we've become more secular, less nationalistic, less patriotic, that you have less resistance to you know, something like multiculturalism because you don't even really know who you are. So if other people come in with various ideas of their identity, it's harder to sort of assert yourself. Um, and I don't know if that's a similar experience to what you guys have seen in Sweden. Yes, indeed. Um, Sweden was such a um, homogeneous society that um, we didn't even realize that we had a culture of our own. We were like the, the, the fish is not really realizing that uh, they're being in the water, you know? So, um, but I guess you've seen an interesting um, development in Sweden. Uh, Christianity was really um, in, the, in the eyes of, of uh, the public in general, uh, not important, um, less and less important, just like in Ireland uh, currently, but um, the amount of people that thinks that Christianity should play a role in society has increased from 20 to 40 percent wow. uh, the last um, 10 years. And I think uh, when you when you get that I experience that enables you to compare with other cultures and civilizations, you realize that, oh, you know, what we used to have, what many of us still have, it's, it's not that bad. You know, for instance, uh, Take uh, humor. Um, the, the, the late uh, Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran, he once stated that uh, there is no fun in Islam. Okay, well, compare that with the irony of Jesus Christ uh, in, in, in the Bible. Um, you know, um, the one without a sin can fa cast the first stone. You know, uh, th that ironic tweak uh, is a sort of... Um, trademark of Western civilization and, and um, humor uh, to, to be able to have self-distance, to be able to, um, you know, um, give someone the benefit of the doubt. That is something that makes it quite easy for us to interact. Well, try to make a project in Iraq like I did. Um, um, you won't get the benefit of the doubt. Rather, uh, you, you'll get the saying, I only open my mouth for, for the dentist because people don't trust each other. You know, those kind of cultural um, confrontations that people are experiencing now make them realize that, yeah, we have something worth preserving and handing over to next generations. But, you know, 
um, I didn't learn, you know, folk dance or, or traditional instruments when I was young. Uh, almost no one in my generation did. So we have lost a lot on the way and we need to find ways to to reinvigorate our own traditions and, and be proud of what we have. While, of course, being honest about those mistakes that our forefathers did. Uh, no questions uh, about that. You know, a typical cultural trademark of the West is that we are able um, to be self-critical. So the approach to migration, as you say, for the past 15 or 20 years has been to uh, bring people in, particularly asylum seekers and, you know, people who are working and so on. What's the alternative solution, do you think? Because a lot of people would say, oh, well, sure, we can't do nothing. We have to help people who are in need. What, what would you say is the alternative fix to this issue? Well, we need to minimize incentives for economic migration because that is, uh, um, that is something, a problem that will become unsustainable throughout this century. Um, and I think the Danish and British asylum plans striking deals with Rwanda is a way forward because uh, then you signal that, okay, there's no point coming here to try to to, to uh, uh, pursue economic migration. You will be flown to Rwanda. If you're actually in need of asylum, you will prov be provided shelter there. Uh, and they have a good reputation for their um, um, caring of, of, of refugees. Um, and that is the way to live up to, uh, you know, the, the principle of solidarity while not sacrificing the well-being, the social fabric, and uh, the future prospects of Sweden, Ireland, and other countries. Um, and I think um, um, the signal with that approach will be very strong. And I've already seen the Irish government blaming the Rwanda plan uh, in the UK for the 600% um, increase in, in, in illegal migration to Ireland. Uh, because apparently these people who were going to the UK, they were not going to get shelter. They were going for economic reasons. And we just need to stop this economic migration. The UK and Den Denmark are, are inspirational in that regard. Do you think that the Irish government is right to blame Britain and Rwanda? Because I've seen people here saying that it's much more likely that the reason our uh, asylum claims are up 600% is the fact that the government is offering uh, free own door accommodation after four months and all types of benefits will, will house the world, will take care of the world, that that would probably be a more compelling factor for somebody to come in than just Britain having a new deportation policy. I, I don't know if you would agree with that. That's what people are saying. I, I think that makes sense. Uh, also, I think uh, a lot of people are drawn to the UK for, you know, the, the reputation that, that the UK has, the, their diasporas that have been established and so on and so forth. If that opportunity does not exist anymore, where do you go? Well, do you stay in France, which has tightened its rules? Or do you go to Ireland, which is, you know, receiving you with open arms and a lot of taxpayer money to provide for you? Well, uh, of course, that um, explanation uh, makes sense. Uh, so um, in, in case Ireland would not want to have, you know, a diverted migration flow from the UK to Ireland, I think it must reconsider. Absolutely. So then moving on to the issue of COVID-19, because obviously Sweden took a very, very different approach to that issue than almost any other European country where we all locked down. Ireland at one point had the longest and strictest lockdown in all of the EU. And by comparison, Sweden really didn't lock down at all. I think they had a couple of restrictions here and there, but for the most part, everything pretty much stayed open. And that personally shocked me because I think Sweden, I think of it as a very liberal country, but that seemed like a very uh, outside the box thing to do, very much against the, the European grain. Were you surprised by that? And, and what was your take on the, the approach? What do you think the, the European continent should have done as regards COVID-19? I was 
was a little bit surprised because Sweden is not only liberal, but yeah, it's big government as well. So I, I would assume that the social democratic government would would use the full force of the state to, to to actually um, limit uh, freedoms. But uh, it was uh, it was a very moderate policy, which I think. Uh, um, came from the fact that Sweden was actually quite unprepared. We, we didn't have the means to, to actually provide um, masks and uh, didn't have the means to, to establish uh, basically quarantine zones around our elderly care homes, which the government is to blame for because it did away with a, a lot of our contingency. So it was a sort of made up policy emanating from the reality of the ground. So no grand strategy behind it from the beginning. But then when the, the policy had set and when we saw the consequences of the lockdowns in other countries, I think the, the popular support grew in Sweden because uh, uh, I think quite a few people realized that this is not the normal way to go about things, to, to lock up, you know, a, a whole population at home and to to shut down schools and uh, to let you know four-year-olds meet their teacher on an ipad you know those kind of things um and and i'm very happy that sweden uh maintained a moderate policy because uh, a lot of uh, psychosocial problems um that that other countries are seeing now with their adolescents uh, um, alcohol problems, abuse. Um, Sweden was able to 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 avoid that to a high extent, um, and I think uh, if it happens again in a similar fashion, I think more countries will do like Sweden. Fewer countries like like those who, who establish strict lockdowns. Uh, but there are lessons to learn from Sweden. We didn't protect the elderly enough, and that is a tragedy that we have to to live with and, and, uh, and uh, to never repeat. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time. Absolutely. My pleasure.